Okay. My guest today on Everything You Need Is Inside is Anya Rosen of Birchwell Clinic. And I am um, so excited to talk to you because I love all things functional medicine and healing and because we have such a strange overlap history. Um, yeah. So Anya's in New York. We used to go to the same yoga studio and run into each other sort of sporadically. And what I forgot in just reconnecting is that uh, Anya moved into the building that I had lived in for seven years and moved out of um, on Mulberry Street. Yeah, so crazy following in your footsteps. Uh, <laughs> so interesting. Um, we we're just talking about New York City briefly, and you're in Williamsburg now. I am. And you like it? I love it. Never thought I'd be a Brooklyn girl, but honestly, I. I, this is where I feel like I'm meant to be right now. Yeah. It's interesting how that works. I feel like I, like I mentioned, I never thought I would leave New York city. And now that I left, I missed it like in sort of little glimmers of like sadness and also know that I'm not meant to live there any longer. Um, and also not very clear on like that Austin is, I've never actually thought Austin is a forever thing. It was sort of, you know, where I came to heal, which I came to learn. And then I think if I'm being really honest, it's uh, where I came to hide. Mm -hmm. So as I'm coming out of, as I've come out of my cocoon, I feel less inclined to hide. So um, yeah. So in that, I think let's jump into virtual clinic and healing journey and um, tell me about what you do. Yeah, so I'm a functional medicine practitioner, even though I'm a registered dietitian by training. Um, so what that means is I help people, you know, identify and treat the root cause of their health issues. So while the conventional medicine approach is, you know, what is your sign or symptom and how can we put a bandaid on that? The functional medicine ideology is always asking why is that sign or symptom manifesting um, and how can we treat that root cause in a holistic way that isn't going to cause any other negative issues? Which is so beautiful and has been such an integral part of my journey, functional medicine. You know, it sort of came in and out of my life, um, but it always spoke to me deeper because, you know, to me, everything's about the root. It's like, like you said, why is this manifesting? What is the emotion behind it? What has it been triggered by? What's the history? Um, because, you know, my symptoms as they showed up, they were never, I would go to the doctor and they'd be like, your, your thyroid's fine. Everything's fine, but you're not getting your period and your adrenals are shot and your cortisol is high and I'm stressed. I'm an entrepreneur. Like, okay, duh. But it wasn't until I dug underneath and looked under the hood to be like, okay, what the hell is going on? So functional medicine to me, I mean, it saved my life in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Because the body keeps the score and it is, it's an exhausting practice to always be asking like, what is the root? What is the root of the root of the root? But it's really, I think the only way that you can truly heal is by like doing that work to, to figure that out and get to that point. So tell me how you got into this. Yeah. So, I mean, I originally went into nutrition because of my own health issues. Um, I went back to get my master's and become an RD, not familiar at all with the functional medicine space. I actually thought I wanted to be a sports dietitian and work with athletes. Um, and then, you know, during that time, I started going through my own hormone and skin journey. I came off of hormonal birth control and I still wasn't getting my period and I was getting really bad rebound acne. Um, I started also to work for a functional medicine practitioner while I was finishing my program. Mm -hmm. And you know, I started to learn about hormones, but also learn the side of hormones that were not taught in school or that your doctor doesn't tell you, such as, you know, how going on birth control can cause negative issues with hormones down the road. Um, things like PCOS, um, things like, you know, amenorrhea and, you know, subclinical thyroid disorder. I started to experience all of these issues learn more about it, but also see it happening with people and patients that I was helping and realize that like, this is really where there's a need in the healthcare system. And this feels like my calling. 
Mm. Because as I was trying to figure out my own issues, I became obsessed with learning and obsessed with researching. And that enabled me to start helping other clients. And I started healing other people. And it just kind of spiraled from there. I love how that works, you know, because I can I can understand so clearly in my own experiences, you know, you sort of attach to what interests you because oftentimes it's a reflection of you or what you're going through in your journey. And as you learn about other people, we learn about ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So you are healing other people. And then in tandem, we're like, oh, well, maybe this is something that I'm experiencing. You know, I, yeah. Yeah, there's a reason why people who who specialize in what they specialize in got into that field. You know, you become kind of obsessed with the topic um, and you also want to help other people so that they don't have to suffer the same way that you have. So when did you start Birchwell? So I, so Birchwell, I rebranded as Birchwell this summer, but I started my own private practice a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was definitely like a gradual transition because I started actually before I even finished school. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, you know, living at home alone during the pandemic. Um, I decided to just fast track everything, finish my master's and do my dietetic internship and start a practice all at the same time, which I definitely don't recommend. (laughs) Um, but you know, I was so passionate about it. And I just realized that if I didn't go full throttle and become obsessed with what I was doing, um, I would miss that, that window of opportunity. So it's been a few years now, but it, it was a gradual start. And then in the past like year or so, it's really picked up. So at what point or where in the journey do people find you? What do they come find you for? Like, what is the, the most, um, relevant complaint that you get? Like who, who's the Birchwell Clinic customer? Well, unfortunately for most people that come to me, I am not their first, second or third practitioner Mm -hmm. that they've seen. Usually I'm, I hear from a lot of people, like this is my last attempt or you're my last resort because like so-and-so recommended me to you. Um, or like I found you through like a deep Google search on the web. Um, that's because, you know, a lot of people aren't familiar with functional medicine. So usually they come to me, they've, they've seen, you know, several doctors over usually one of two issues. Um, it's usually a gut issue and or hormonal imbalance. Those are the two main things that I see in my practice. I do see definitely autoimmunity. Um, I see a lot of other like, like eczema or other or psoriasis or other skin issues, um, you know, joint pain and, and whatnot, but hormones and gut are really the two things that make up like you know, 80% of my practice. Um, And those are the two problems that I see the most with people. Yeah. I mean, personally, I, with a functional medicine doctor in Austin, I sort of did like a whole gut cleanse and had to wipe out all my flora, rebuild all my flora. And I found that in where it was in my healing journey was, I just took it as energetically. It was like this piece of like, really uh, like honing into trust myself And if I had all these critters and, you know, SIBO and, you know, some sort of parasite, then how could I actually like be in my body and trust my, my intuition. And a huge part of my healing journey was like colonics and enemas and really like clearing. Um, But then also just like rebuilding flora, et cetera. So I can totally relate to the gut stuff. And I think more than not people, most people have gut issues and they're just so unaware of it because we've been feeding ourselves for so long and like stuff stays in you. Like, you know, there's bacteria, there's overgrowth, there's, you know, things. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like for a lot of people, it's a very uncomfortable topic. Um, for many people, I'm the first person that they've told that they're having like, you know, chronic constipation or, you know, that they're always bloated or, or whatnot. And it's, it's something that, you know, it's just very taboo and it's very suppressed for a lot of people and it can really make or break your quality of life having good digestion. It's, you know, it's, it's like night and day. It's such, so interesting. And we're so weird about talking about it. Like I remember when I first started getting clonics in New York city, I was like embarrassed about it. And then it like became my like secret, not even a secret. It was like my favorite secret because it's what helped me so much is actually on the colonic table that I was first introduced this idea of plant medicine, because as I was getting a colonic, the woman was telling about 5-MeO-DMT and that was what like led me down this journey. So it was actually colonics that led me to plant medicine, which is interesting, but you know, we're, we're so weird about talking about bathroom stuff. And 
uh, I know personally, like if, if I'm not regular, like if I feel stuck, that shifts my energy for the whole day, like to be productive when you're feeling stuck. And so often it's energetic, it's anxiety, it's what we're carrying, you know, and then obviously in the functional medicine realm, it's like, you know, what's actually going on in the gut or, you know, and stool tests and whatever else, but I'm sure you do all of that. Yeah, it absolutely, you know, I do think that there are so many people where their stress and anxiety and trauma directly affects their digestion. It's very interesting. You know, we do all of the testing and we treat whatever we find and they're still having issues that don't get resolved until they address the mental mm-hmm. health side of things. Um, but there are also just so many people that, you know, just have not done proper testing or have not, you know, made the right adjustments to their diet and lifestyle to accommodate better digestion. And just by doing that alone, they're able to get better. Um, And that in turn has a positive effect on their mental health. So it goes both ways. Yeah. And I think that's what's so interesting about functional medicine. It's like, not just what's showing up the symptom, but like the cause. So just to speak to what you said, you know, talking about trauma and how it affects the gut. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I see this all the time with my patients because I do a very thorough intake assessment with all of them. And I do ask them if they've had trauma, if they've had any like major life events, you know, I ask a lot about their current state of state of mental health and their mind. And I do find that it goes hand in hand with digestive issues, both both constipation, and diarrhea, but other, you know, like parasites and and bacterial overgrowth and and yeast and whatnot. Um, and again, it's, it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. Sometimes it's some, one thing can lead to another with, you know, trauma induced GI disorders. I, I tell them right off the bat that we can do everything with nutrition and supplements, but if you're not addressing the trauma, then you're not going to get better. Mm. I get that it's truly impossible. So it really is, I think a block for healing for a lot of people, because it's also, I think one of the hardest things to address. Yeah. It's, I think that we carry so much as humans because, you know, trauma has become such a buzzword and it doesn't have to mean like a major life event, like a sexual assault. It can mean like being bullied in the playground when you were five and like you peed in your pants or something, you know, and like that's traumatic. Right. Um, but we carry that. We really carry that. And I think so often not only just carry that in our body energetically, but also like in our gut internally, like how we release, how we let go. Um, as opposed to just like what we're holding on to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and hormones as well too. You know, I see so often that women who do have any sort of traumatic experience are having like irregular absent cycles, hmm. um, which is, is really huge, or they just have like really suppressed hormones in general. Um, you know, and, and that I think also the conventional answer that they're always receiving that I received as well is go on birth control. Mm-hmm. Um, or or don't go on birth control and just don't have a period and then maybe if you want to get pregnant like we'll pump you with fertility drugs um so <laughs> the amount of thing yeah the of times i've heard that from several doctors like oh you don't need to have a period like if you want to get pregnant we'll shoot you up like you'll be fine um you know which is just it's so sad to to know that that is the answer that most women are getting and that because this isn't really talked about, they don't really know any better and they don't really know why it's not okay to not have a period. I think it's such a different, there's such a different masculine and feminine view of this. Like to me, such a moniker of my health is getting a regular period. And as you mentioned, like my hormones have been suppressed as a result of like multiple traumas over my life. I didn't realize that because they weren't conscious until they were conscious and I understood, but so much of my healing journey and and um, sort of remembering these subconscious repressed memories was also realizing that like something very pivotal happened right when I got my period and I was shamed for having my period and I was assaulted. And since then my period hasn't been normal. And it actually took a medicine journey for me to remember that and then to release my body, to, like release that emotion. And then seven days later, for the first time in years, I got my period, you know, it was like, my body was holding on to that so tightly. And, um, yeah, it's sad. And at the same time, it's fucking phenomenal. Right. Yeah. It's so crazy how that works with periods too. It's like, you know, I, I have this again with many, many patients where I'm like, I can give you like all of the herbs. I can give you Vitex and inositol and like, we could do all the seed cycling and all the meditation and whatnot. But if you're not actually addressing like the trauma, and I also, I see a lot of the time with like people with depression 
that was the case for me. If you're not addressing that, like you're not going to get a period. It's so interconnected. It's crazy. Mm. And our and hormones are so sensitive. Yeah. yeah. Really <laughs> They're so sensitive. You know, it's so interesting too. Like you mentioned, like doctor saying, what do you need a period for? I had a doctor say to me, like people pay to not get their period. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, that's not me because to me, it was like, I'm a woman. Like I want to be able to, you know, have this flow every month, be in my feminine. And a lot of, as a result of trauma sort of put me in this guarded protection mode where I was more in my masculine energy, which didn't also allow me to get a period because I was so guarded. Right. And life changes, healing, et cetera, you know, bodies working more normally, but anything that throws me off, like a breakup, a big move, whatever it is, it's like the period is the first thing to go. Yeah. And like, it's, it's a really, really, really important like data point, right? It, it's a fifth, it's called the fifth bio sign throughout the functional medicine world for a reason. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, it's really inconvenient and having, you know, PMS symptoms and dealing with the bleeding and the cramping and the breakouts, it sucks. But your period tells you so much important information about your body. You know, not only like having a regular period is is telling us like, okay, maybe your body is feeling safer, but also if your period is really painful, mm-hmm. very likely that you have a lot of inflammation. If you're getting spotting, if you're getting like uh, clotting, if you're getting like any sort of like crazy, like mood swings. Um, this is all really good information that like, we can't really get this data from, from blood tests necessarily, but it can clue us into more, more things that are happening with your body um, that maybe could indicate some other imbalances that would rear its ugly head in other ways outside of your period. Hmm. So tell me again, cause you mentioned birth control and when people come to you and they've been on birth control or, um, you know, sort of in that detox, like what does that look like in terms of getting off birth control and trying to regulate again, like in your journey or in what you've seen? So let me just say it's very, very different for everyone. And it depends on many factors. Um, A huge factor I think is how long you've been on it and what your health has been like while you've been on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'll talk about myself first and then you talk about like what I also see in my practice. For me, you know, I was on birth control for 10 years and I didn't really treat my body well during that time. I overexercised. I wasn't eating enough for my activity level. I was dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of sadness. So when I came off the pill, it took me, you know, two plus years to start getting a period again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it didn't happen until again, I was, I was in a, ha- a happier place and, and feeling really like at peace with myself. Um, but it also, you know, I dealt with like that post pill acne. I dealt with a lot of like really, really bad mood swings and, you know, really bad cramping and insomnia. Um, so for me, it was a long journey and it was a rocky journey for some women. They come off of birth control and they get their period right away and they feel great. But for a lot of people, they have a similar experience to me where it takes them a lot of time to get their cycle. And when they get their cycle, they have a lot of bad hormonal symptoms that were not even present before they went on birth control. Um, a lot of that is because, you know, first of all, you get that rebound of androgens that happens when you come off of hormonal birth control. And that can cause like a lot of like the post pill acne that I see all of the time with women. Um, but then also it's because while you're on birth control and you're suppressing those hormones and you're losing that fifth vital sign, some other negative, you know, lifestyle or diet behaviors that have, that you've been practicing, you know, start ha- finally have a chance to reflect in your hormones and in your period. And those issues that have just been like quietly band-aided start to come up and start to play. You know, personal story, because my period was always irregular. And then, uh, you know, I moved in with an ex-boyfriend and that sort of threw off my cycle. And then really finding, I find that like finding grounding in my body, like really feeling safe and feeling home because I've had a past history of trauma is what creates like the regularity in my digestive system, the regularity in my sleep, the regularity in my hormones. Right. And, um, a lot of 
transitions led me, you know, where I am right now, which is fine. I started getting a normal period, then it got thrown off. And then I was meant to go on this egg freezing journey because I would like to have kids. I just don't know what that looks like yet. And I know that, you know, a lot of women go through this single and want children. And what does that look like? Um, so I was meant to go on an, an egg freezing journey, but it was right after like this really intense breakup. And I was like, you know what? I'm going through all of these sort of stages of grief, like anger, depression. Like, do I want that to be in the eggs that I'm going to get extracted from my body? Like, no, energetically it felt off, Yeah, but I had committed and they'd put me on birth control because they wanted to make sure that I was, you know, my hormones were regular before they did this retrieval. So I was on it for like two weeks and I haven't been on like what, 15 years birth control. And, um, I was nervous because I don't like putting anything extra in my body hormonally. And similarly, I felt like I was also at a grounded place enough to not be that scared teenager that was like, Oh my God, am I going to get fat? Like, I don't, I didn't have that sentiment. So I actually felt great on it. Like I felt like my estrogen was really balanced. I felt more in my body. I felt like quite feminine. Um, but then as I went off of it after two or three weeks, I was like, I'm not doing this and I don't want to be on the pill and it threw off my hormones. Yeah. You know, so like, I wonder now, like, what is it going to take for me to re-regulate, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it will probably take some time. I'm sure it will. But that, that's the other thing that I do hear a lot. I experienced it myself. People going, oh, I feel totally fine on birth control. I felt absolutely fine on birth control while I was on it, right? But like, I didn't like the idea of having my body depend on those hormones. And I didn't like the idea of masking that sign. Like, at, and for example, one thing that led me to become a dietitian was I really, I got a really bad stress fracture in my foot um, because I was, I was running so much and I was under eating and that stress fracture led me to go get a bone density test. And I found out I had low bone density for my age. Um, and I was, you know, in my early twenties, which is very concerning. And you know, one of the questions that my doctor asked, which should have been asked to me years and years ago was, was, are you getting a, a regular cycle? And I said, yes. And then this follow-up question was, well, are you getting a regular cycle? Are you on birth control? And I said, yes. My doctor explained, this is a good doctor, <laughs> explained that, okay, so you're, you're not getting a cycle. You're, you're getting a birth control withdrawal bleed. Like we don't know if you're actually getting a cycle you know, given your weight and, you know, your, your lifestyle and your diet, you probably would not be getting a normal natural cycle if you weren't on the pill. And that could have alerted you to the fact that, you know, maybe your, your bone density was declining, right? So that's an example of a time when like, it's really helpful to have that data because it's a, it can be a red flag before things can get worse and problems can, can spiral. Hmm. So true. And then let me ask too, how, because I assume like in the hormone world and birth control, like is anything, any of this connected to the thyroid and like the metabolism or where does that like fit in? Yeah, they're all interconnected. They're all. So, you know, that's the whole idea is that you have like your HPA axis, your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that's why having, you know, trauma or any sort of like, you know, mental stressors are going to to manifest in your hormones because it is so interconnected and your hormone production is dependent on that. Um, and so when that is suppressed, your hormones are too. So in your journey, you sort of were working for a functional medicine doctor. You got into like, so intrigued by birth control detox and like hormones and healing. Um, how did you go from where you were like overworking out, underweight to sort of you know, start stepping on the right track, because I think so many people, you know, in their quiet experience, digestive issues, hormonal issues, not knowing how to feed themselves properly, underworking out, overworking out, like, what did it look like for you to start healing and then to get where you are? Right. I mean, I think a huge part really comes down to, to learning, mm. understanding, you know, because I think a lot of the mistakes that people make are because they're trying to you know, garner all this information for, about health and wellness from Instagram or, you know, from magazines and, and all these like scattered sources that are maybe unreliable, but it also are speaking to the general public. Um, you know, I think first it really was helpful for me just to have that scientific academic training, you know, getting my master's and just learning more about, you know, anatomy and physiology and 
nutritional biochemistry and all of that really helping me to understand, um, you know, food and how it relates to our body. But then also having my own practitioner who is able to adjust and tailor things for me and, you know, give me recommendations that were specific to me because really, and this is kind of, you know, my philosophy with my own practice, everything needs to be individualized with health and wellness. And what is good for one person can be horrible for the next. Um, so it's really important to, I think, again, like learn like the actual science behind things, but then work with someone else who can tailor recommendations for you and your needs specifically. Hmm. And once you find that person, I would maybe just add on to that, be as honest as possible about every little thing. Like there's no shame. No shame at all. I've heard it all. Like, yeah, <laughs> um, no shame, no judgment. Like, you know, I think even as like practitioners, like I'm not perfect. I have my own struggles too. And I, and I, I always will, I think in some sort of ways, um, but you know, the more honest you are with your practitioner, whether that's a functional medicine practitioner or a doctor or, or healer or not, the more they're able to help you. Yeah. I mean, that's how I work with my clients too. It's like, I, I actually think it's what makes me good at what I do. And same with you. It's like, there is no judgment. And, you know, if I were to think about like little Olivia, I wish she had felt so much less shame about what she was feeling because you know, there are people that can help, but you can't be helped unless you're willing to just really open yourself up to the possibility that someone wants to help you instead of hurt you or judge you or shame you. So, um, anyone listening, like there is nothing to be ashamed of. We all have bodies and they all work and don't work and, you know, systems that are stuck and not stuck. It's like about this collective energy to allow things to really flow together. Right. Yeah. And like, I think that also accepting that like it's society makes it really, really, really hard to be healthy. Mm. Um, you know, it's like this idea like, oh, like you can like look great and like, you know, have great energy and great sex and great skin, but also like go out and drink every night and like stay out until 3 a.m. and like, you know, eat like pizza and fries at a bar it's like the idea of you know like, like the chill girl <laughs> I mean in a way but I'm like that that that's not possible like you really can't have it all um so you know there is there is a, a, a responsibility that I think that we all can take to some degree but I think that also we need to be a little bit more easy on ourselves that it's really 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 hard to be a healthy person now mm -hmm. um especially a healthy woman yeah <laughs> so yeah there, there's I no there, there's no shortcut. No. And I think, I think the more attuned you come, be, you become in your body, the more sensitive you are to the excess, the extra, like, I'm, I'm so curious you post beautiful pictures of food and you've had a journey with food as have I. So learning to really feed yourself is also part of the learning and the process, trying things that work and don't work as opposed to following some protocol that someone who's not in your body tells you. So what does that look like for you? What is your relationship to food now? And what do you, when clients come in, like, do you recommend, do you suggest, or what's your philosophy on, on feeding yourself? Yeah. So I think that there's an, another dietitian and functional medicine practitioner who I really love, Michelle Shapiro, actually posted something about this today that I think really speaks to this and is really relevant. And it's that, you know, I eat in a certain way, not so that I can like look a certain way or have a certain body type, but because that makes my body feel good. Mm. And that's definitely like my approach to food too. Um, I believe that, you know, the best diet for most people is one that is the most varied, um, but that you could still tolerate well. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, for me, like, I don't really have any, any food sensitivities. I know certain foods don't agree with me, like too much alcohol, too much sugar. Um, but you know, I'm fine with gluten and dairy, so I can eat gluten and dairy and, you know, it is what it is, but the bulk of my food is going to be, you know, whole minimally processed, um, you know, more nutrient dense foods, but at the same time, I work with a lot of people that have a lot of food sensitivities and have, you know, autoimmune conditions and, and other intolerances, and, and they need to restrict a little bit more. And for those people, that might be fine too. I think that a general theme with my nutrition approach for people, um, 
And again, there's there's always exceptions to this, but I find that most people don't eat enough protein. Um, and I think that that is like a hugely like under appreciated <laughs> nutrient um, that is not only you know important for body composition and it's not just for bodybuilders, but it's also really important for a variety of things, including mental health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, amino acids are the building blocks for neurotransmitters. So a lot of people that come with anxiety or mood disorders, we up their protein intake significantly with high quality protein sources, and we're able to improve their mood with just that alone. So fascinating. I, I, uh, I mean, we met at a yoga studio and I, I've always, or for the past, what, two plus decades been super active three, I mean, years. And, um, I also was convinced that like eating 80, 20 vegetables to protein was like what I should do, what my body should do. And like, without acknowledging that, like I had IBS, I had digestive issues from trauma. Um, but I didn't know that was what they were. And still I fed myself like raw vegetables. And then I like got really into sardines and omega-3 fish. And, um, I called it the startup diet. Cause it was when I was starting my business box and flow and I had like no budget. So it was sardines, sweet potatoes, avocados, eggs, and beer. <laughs> Cause I love beer. <laughs> um, but like gluten doesn't agree with me and still I love beer. And, uh, and I guess fast forward, you know, I've shifted into almost 80, 20 protein to anything else. So I eat carbs. I'm not sensitive to anything. And I don't have like a protocol. I like eat oatmeal in the morning and then I like protein for the majority of the day. And the way that my energy has shifted is like tenfold. Like I was so against majority of protein because because I'm so active, I didn't want to gain muscle because I do, my body holds onto muscle pretty easily, but I'm quite lean. And, um, you know, there's like this little switch of like, okay, yes, you can lift heavy weights and eat more protein and you're not going to get like, you know, like built. Um, and it just shifted my energy. And also, you know, I just checked in with my functional medicine doctor. Cause I do have a, um, a thyroid. I take a thyroid medication, armor thyroid for a sluggish thyroid. And he's like, well, consider, you know, carbs are really good for the thyroid. Um, so now I'm just sort of like playing with what is my body hungry for? Just eat that. Like, just listen. Yeah. And like, listen, for, for most people, the answer, it's not a sexy answer. It's usually like everything in moderation. Yeah. Um, you know, everything, at least for, I would put an asterisk, like everything nutrient dense in moderation. So like, you don't have, like, don't completely eliminate carbs. Don't completely eliminate fast. Don't completely eliminate proteins. Like find a balance among them all. And that balance might shift day to day as well. Yeah. And I think that's just a matter of like, I don't like the phrase intuitive eating because I think it's like fed by Instagram nutritionists that are like judging macros and calories. Like that's to me, it's just nails on a chalkboard, but it's like you said, like feed your body, what it, what it asks for, you know, like really find that connection with yourself, this vessel that carries you. So you're not picking food from your mind, which I used to do of like salads and you're actually like grounding into your gut and your, your body. And you're like, I mean, as a woman too, like your reproductive system, like, what do I need? Like, what do I need right now? Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. I've, I have so many issues with the whole intuitive eating movement. That's like a whole different can of worms. But I also think that like, this is where kind of like, you know, I think it's helpful to work with someone because when you are already so disconnected from your body and from your, how your body relates to food, I think it's really helpful to have someone like in those early phases, start to give you guidance, even though I don't know your body and I don't know how you're feeling. I can look at your symptoms and I can look at your health history and I can already sort of get a sense with my expertise, like the type of diet tweaks that would help you start feeling better. Mm -hmm. And then once you start feeling better and you start feeling more like yourself, then from there, I think that you can start to tune into your body more and start to you know, make those adjustments like and play it by ear because you're, you're more at balance and you're more like, you know, in a home state of a state of health where you're able to do that. I think like so much of it is sort of taking out that extra anxiety and nerves and maybe too much caffeine or the hangover from alcohol that leads to depression. You know, it's like this spiral effect where the sugar and the blood sugars like 
never being able to find calm. And when you're not at a place of homeostasis, how do you make the right decisions? It's almost like ass backwards. I know. Yeah. The, the alcohol and caffeine, I mean, you, you know, New York city very well, and you know, that the average New Yorker lives off of those two things. And it's, you know, this is another thing, core part of what I do. And I think that's, that's kind of tough in the functional medicine space is find a way to help people feel better and heal without compromising or, or sacrificing their social health. Mm -hmm. I think that social wellness is one of the most underappreciated aspects of overall well-being. And the alcohol is a very key component of the social scene in, in New York City, especially, but all over. Um, so it can be really hard to help people to navigate that and figure out ways to, if they still want to drink, to still drink, but like in a way that is more health promoting. Um, but it does feed into that vicious cycle. And when you are in that vicious cycle with the alcohol and the caffeine, your ability to make helpful food choices is, is going to be affected as well. Completely. It's something I, you know, I've shifted my relationship to alcohol so much and I've never been um, good at drinking, which I say, you know, I'm one or two. And mm -hmm. Even that, like I've sort of shifted to like one every so often and now newly single, it's like the dating game. And I'm very comfortable going out for uh, a date or drink and ordering a, a sparkling water because I actually think that being sober allows you to be so like have so much more discretion of how you behave, but also how you're interacting and what you're choosing to do you know, call them again or want to see them again or whatever else, or even have dinner that night. But um, so it's something that it's, it's in my head of like, how do I want to proceed with my relationship with alcohol around this next chapter? And I'm not going to make a sweeping decision. I'll make game time decisions, but, um, you know, I've all, so many of my clients come to me and are like, oh, and I drink too much. And then I called him again, or I did this. And it's like, I always go to the trigger and the trigger in 85% of the situations is always alcohol. I know. And it's, it's so hard when you're dating and you're single. I mean, I was dating and single for six years straight and, and I get, it's, it's really rough. And, you know, I did all the things I, I said, I was sober and I was completely sober for several months. And then, you know, it's going back to drinking, you know, having three, four drinks and on a date in one night. And I think that like the first thing is like, it's a lot easier for people to put on that label, right. To be like, Oh, I drink or I don't. I think it's a lot harder to like live in that gray zone, which you just described where you're making those game time decisions. But I think that that is really where like true health and thriving is, is usually living in that gray zone. Yeah. Um, one little, little hack that I like to tell my clients to do is if you're trying to like drink less to order soda water with bitters, um, because that kind of like gives you the feel like you're having a cocktail or a drink and the bitters are actually good for digestion. Yeah. Um, so that's just a little, a little trick. So sometimes like if they're like trying to switch from doing two drinks to one, like, you know, the first drink, maybe make it a cocktail. And then after that, just do soda water with bitters. Yeah. I mean, I love soda water with bitters and, um, yeah, I think it's an interesting conversation and the sober movement or sober curious and mocktail movement has become like, so she, she, it's like, so interesting to see mocktails on a cocktail menu that are still $14. They may not be 20, but they're 14. And, um, mm -hmm. It's also just a lot of sugar. So it's just like have a seltzer or whatever, bitters and yeah, or have a glass of wine, whatever it works, you know, but, and then also alcohol, so much sugar in it on top of everything else. Like I used to get hangovers from the sugar as opposed to just even just the alcohol or it would affect my sleep. So the hangover would really not be about the alcohol, but about the lack of sleep, you know, it's just sensitive. Yeah. And like, I think that there's, there's a lot of reasons why I think the sober movement is happening. Um, I know that also like Andrew Huberman, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with him. Yeah. Love, so he, yeah. I love him too. Um, but he, so he came out with this podcast, I think over the summer, that was basically all about alcohol, right. And its effects on the brain and, and whatnot. And I think a lot of people who are huge follow, followers of him, like, you know, started advocating for, for drinking less after that. But I, I think that like, again, like one very, very important and often overlooked aspect of health is social health and social well-being. And I think a lot of people who are like, have a very difficult time limiting their alcohol intake while still being social, mm -hmm. they think that it's one or the other. And I think that that is where like having like a coach or guidance really comes in is figuring out like, how can you 
how can you do both at the same time? Because you don't want to like become a hermit for the sake of quote unquote health. Cause that's just gonna, that's gonna backfire as well. That's gonna make you even less healthy actually. Yeah. And it's interesting too. It's be- like what I see is that, you know, alcohol impairs your judgment. So one, you go out and you're like, I'm just gonna have a glass of wine. And then everybody's ordering another one. So you have another one or whatever it is. I think having strong boundaries, like I can be out at a bar and not have anything to drink because I'm very clear in my own boundary. And like, I don't need to be these days today, you know, younger version of me needed Mm -hmm. to quell social anxiety. Now I feel very confident in like not ordering a drink and being the observer. (laughs) I actually think it, it allows you to listen clear and allows you to be more present in your body as opposed to numbing out. And I think that there's a really fine, fine line, um, you know, in, in terms of intention, like, why are we drinking, you know, forget everything else around it. Like I sleep like shit and I make like less informed decisions. Really. It's like, what's my intention? Am I doing this? Because I don't really want to be where I am. Don't really want to be with the people I'm with. Um, because it's not socially acceptable to say no, thank you. Or like, is my intention just because like, I want to have fun and I have more fun when I'm present, like fully present. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And I think that's something that also helps me a lot with my ability to like, you know, be okay with not drinking in social settings. Cause you know, I, I still drink here and there, but not nearly as much is recognizing that like I was choosing to drink because I felt that social anxiety. And I was like, I don't want to be the weird one not drinking, mm-hmm. but then realizing that like everyone is just worrying about themselves. And if anyone actually cares and is negatively affected by the fact that you're choosing not to drink like they are not a person that you want to to be with exactly. anyway yeah, yeah. And our people like I don't know judgment of of others is such a projection of self so I have a hard time with this like almost peer pressure bullying of like what do you mean you're not gonna drink you know it's like the people that you're meant to be with that love you, accept you unconditionally, they don't give a shit if you drink or not drink. Same as you wouldn't care if they did either. Like this goes back to this idea of like really being in our bodies and making informed decisions for what feels good for us. Right. Yeah. And the same thing goes with food too. You know, I have a lot of clients that are like, you know, let's say they're like doing like business meetings or, and, and, you know, or going on dates and they're like, oh, I don't want to be the one like ordering like the salad when like I'm going out with someone who's like getting a burger and like, I'm afraid that they're going to judge me for making like this decision. And I'm like, like no one is, no one is thinking about that. Like mm-hmm. everyone is in their own bubbles, in their own heads, thinking about themselves. And also oftentimes people get inspired and like, they like the fact when people around them are making healthier decisions because it almost acts for some people like as a gateway for them to do the same thing. Right. An icebreaker or like, you know, yeah, I, I wish for our generation, younger generation, everyone that we could be less afraid, ashamed of honoring what we need as opposed to what others might think of us. Because like, again, it's like, judgment of others is projection of self. Like if I'm at dinner and someone wants a salad, you know, I might be like, ugh, younger version of me might've been that way. But the ugh was like, I really just wanted a salad. So why, you know, and it's not real. Like our decisions are our own. Our boundaries are our own. Our choices are our own. They don't have anything to do with anybody else. So like if I'm ever with someone or even out at a bar or a drink and someone were to be like, you're not drinking, I would just be like, why does that even impact you at all? <laughs> like, why does that even affect you in a bit? Yeah. If anything, it's a good way when you are dating to test people. <laughs> right. To yeah. really be conscious, to really be present. Yeah. So in that, I know that you've put out such beautiful guides about like natural remedies for stress or gut health or sleep. Can you give us some some quick tips on like, um, natural ways to be re-embodied. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it, it really does depend on, on what you're dealing with. Um, so the, I think the guide that you're referencing is, is the anxiety guide, which I, again, I think it kind of, it's very closely intertwined with, with the gut issues and the hormonal issues, but I feel like pretty much every single person experiences anxiety now to, to some degree. Um, so I think like quick rapid fire tips, like just for anxiety alone that I mentioned, the guide would be like, I'm like, we just discussed eating enough protein. 
Um, you know, for most people that's about like 30 grams, three to four times a day at least. Um, so making sure that you're doing that, I think, you know, when it comes to supplements, most people do need at least one or two supplements. Um, so it's the winter time. I think it would be a smart move for almost anyone right now to test your vitamin D and supplement according to that. Um, that's going to help your mood. That's going to help your hormones. That's going to help your gut as well. Um, aside from that, the second top supplement that I'd say most people need is some form of magnesium. It's really, really hard to get enough from the diet. That's important for proper digestion. Um, it's involved in hundreds of reactions in the body. So it's, it's mm. really important for everything. Um, and then well, magnesium, cause I know there's different kinds. Yeah. So it really depends for most people. Magnesium glycinate is a safe bet. It's really well tolerated. Um, it's really well absorbed and it has a very relaxing calming effect. So it's great to take at night. It's going to help you sleep better as well. Um, if you're dealing with constipation, magnesium citrate can be helpful because it has a very slight laxative effect. You don't want to like have to be dependent on it. It's not like you build a tolerance to it, but you want to address, of course, the root cause of why you're constipated but if you need some relief, that could be helpful. Um, and magnesium three and eight is really helpful if you're like, um, you know, dealing with cognitive decline. So a lot of my older patients will start taking that as well. Okay. Um, so glycinate for sleep, you said, mm -hmm. um, how many milligrams? About 240 to 320 is usually a good amount. Okay. Interesting. Good to know. Um, do you have a favorite probiotic? Yes. Um, so my my general most people for probiotics i really like doing a spore based probiotic um there's others that i use for specific issues but spore based are really well tolerated they're really effective they could also help drive out some bad bacteria as well um so you know proflora megaspore orthospore are all examples of a probiotics i actually have a blog post also oh, talking okay. about as well. yeah. yeah um so to, to tie all these ends together, two final questions. First is just quick advice to your younger self. Yeah, um, I guess to my younger self, my advice would probably be like drop your ego and your labels mm -hmm. because it took me, I think, a decent amount of time to find this career path because when I was younger, I just thought that, you know, I was going to work in, in consulting and just, you know, climb the corporate ladder and that that was who I was. I was this, you know, you know, numbers driven analytical, like ice queen. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until like, I really like cracked that barrier and really just like allowed myself to ask myself, what do I actually want? What am I actually passionate and interested in? That I was able to discover that it was working in nutrition and eventually functional medicine and and finally feel happy and free. So I really think like again, like drop your ego and drop your labels. Mm -hmm. um, be open to to the other possibilities for yourself. Amen. Um and then in closing, what does the phrase everything we need is inside mean to you? I think that it means that we have the power within us to heal. That we don't need necessarily like all these other drugs and, and medications and whatnot to feel better. That we have that capability if we just look hard enough, but also if we have the right guidance to mm -hmm. help us find it. Um, so you want to find someone who isn't looking everywhere else for, for other ways to band-aid and and suppress your symptoms, but it's helping you do the digging deep inside your own body to figure out what's wrong and, and how you can address it from the inside out. Beautiful. And um, where can we find you, Anya? Yeah, so you can visit my website. It's www.virtual.clinic um, or on Instagram, which is just virtual.clinic. I love it. Um, you're such a wealth of knowledge and your energy is so calming. I can imagine that people look forward to coming in and sharing with you and being so open is just creates an environment of, of openness. And I, 
I commend you and applaud you for that because it sounds like you've dug underneath and into your dark places so that you can help others let, be less ashamed and less afraid of digging into theirs. So thank you for being on that path because it creates an opening for all of us. Thank you. And thank you for doing the exact same thing and helping so many people by sharing your story. Thank you. Such a gift to see you. Yeah. I can't wait to share this. Thank you so much always. I'm going to sign off.